All right, let's officially get the show started. This is going to be a fun one. I love when we have guests from the outside that don't typically come on the show. This is going to be his first time on. And he uh, he's a specialist in bail reform. Uh, this this gentleman, he's an attorney. I graduated a long time ago, yet I, I was surprised. He looks like a spring chicken when we got to meet backstage. He's also got a master's degree in education from Tarleton State, uh, as well as getting his law degree from Texas Tech School of Law. Very intelligent guy, very knowledgeable on bail reform, and we've got some great conversations we're going to bring up. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're at home right now, and if you're on the screen right now, give a little thumb snap, a little high five, a little claps to each other. Ken W. Good. What's going on, brother? Hey, thanks for having me. You are a lively group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you saw us when we were just chilling beforehand, but once the lights go on, it's game time. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> Ken, I, I introduced you a little bit. Can you uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and how you're involved in bail reform, how you got involved in bail reform? Uh, yes, I'm, a, I'm an attorney in Texas. I've been an attorney for 30 years. Uh, I've been started out practicing law, representing doctors and hospitals when they get sued. I started doing a lot of appellate work, so I've already argued in a lot of the appellate courts across Texas. Someone, uh, bondsman had some default judgments, and so someone asked, who do you hire? And they said, we need an appellate attorney. And so I fixed that situation for the bondsman. I guess word spread, and uh, my practice grew. I represent several insurance companies as their Texas counsel. I'm on the board of directors for the professional bondsman of Texas. I've argued the two most important cases in, in involving bail law in Texas before the Court of Criminal Appeals and won them both. And mm -hmm. uh, appear before the legislature on bail matters, proposed legislation, and in working on these alleged, uh, what we call bail reform, to improve the criminal justice system, not to tear it down. Excellent. And Ken, as, as some people don't know in the audience, uh, everybody right now in the United States of America knows what the Texas Democrats did by leaving the state during, you know, legislature and how big of a deal that was. What people and, and we, everybody thinks this is just about voting laws. But in fact, it sounds like there is something going on uh, in the state. And, and honestly, I didn't even know. And I usually pay attention to local laws and state laws that there is a huge uh, bill trying to be passed regarding uh, regarding the the actual bail reform system. Is that correct? What exactly is going on in the state of Texas regarding that? And what are you working on and, and how are you involved? Uh, well, this is the third, se third session that we've had bills proposed for bail reform. The last two sessions before that, they've ended in stalemate. This session, we had a bill that passed the Senate uh, with a proposed constitutional amendment to allow more people to be held in jail without bail. And then uh, it was before the House, it was right behind the election integrity bill and the Democrats delayed it till 11 and the deadline was to vote on the bill by midnight. They couldn't delay it any longer. And so they walked and depriving the House of a quorum. Once they walked, it also deprived them of a quorum for the next bill, which was our bill. And so we got pushed to the special session along with the, uh, with the election integrity bill. Again, the same thing. We, they started the same place they ended. We made a few changes to the bill. It's already been voted out of the Senate with the constitutional amendment, which requires a two-thirds vote of the of the of the House and the Senate. And so we're now just waiting for the House to come back. Uh, so once again, the election integrity bill is holding up bail reform. And as Senator Huffman, who's carrying the uh, uh, bail reform bills, did on the floor of the Senate, she read the names of five or six victims in Houston who she claims died because this bill was not passed during the legislative session and that if this bill had passed during the legislative session, those people would have been allowed to be held in jail and, and their victims would not have been murdered. Wow. Um, Casey's going to have a question for you in a second. If you guys could do me a favor, we've got a decent amount watching. We're a little over 130. We're starting to hit numbers again, which is good to see uh, with, with some of you guys sharing the page consistently. But I need you guys to either give me a thumbs up, a heart, or the care symbol if you can. And if you have the resiliency in your gut to share this out there, please share it on the count of three. Three, two, I just skipped two. Three, two, one. Go ahead and share this out there. Casey, what's your question for Ken? Well, first of all, numbers are hard. So I, I get counting. Um, no, my question for you, Ken, is what will the bell reform bills – what, it, what what will they accomplish? So are are they, with them being so close to being passed, like what is the main goal of these bills that you're you're talking about? 
Well, I think the number one goal that the bills do is requires uh, a magistrate to review a criminal history before setting bail. Uh, the bills are named after uh, Damon Allen, who was a trooper who was killed by someone he stopped on a traffic stop. Uh, and the reason why he was killed is um, uh, Mr. Black, that was the name of the driver, had been arrested for uh, assaulting a peace officer in, in Smith County. He had a significant criminal history, but the magistrate didn't look at his criminal history. So he said a low bond. And then when the criminal history was brought to his attention, he raised the bond. And that's the reason why there was a warrant when he was stopped on the side of the road. And so the major part of the bill, in my, my opinion, is uh, requiring magistrates to review criminal histories before setting bail. And I think there's other parts to it in uh, uh, training for judges on setting bail. But uh, I think the major change will be reviewing criminal histories as a requirement before setting bail. Current law allows it as uh, is something the court has the discretion to do, but this will require it uh, as a mandatory uh, thing that the judges have to do before setting bail. Why is there oh. pushback on that? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> the problem on bail reform is not uh, on those types of issues. The big problem with bail reform is how do you magistrate large groups of people through your county jail in our big urban areas? Because you've got massive numbers of people. And how do you get those people through the jail quickly and efficiently? That's where we have huge fights and disagreements. You know, historically, Texas has used bail schedules. Uh, this, the federal cases have involved lack of procedures. Then there's misrepresentations about what that has actually done. And so now in Harris County, they're just simply releasing people on a $100 PR bond. You see crime increasing because that was a failure. It was a failure in New York It was tri when it was tried. And so the real fight on bail reform is is how do you uh, handle these large groups of people in our urban areas? And I don't know if our bill actually does a good job on addressing that. Now, what it does is, is allows a county to use a bail schedule and it codif codifies what the uh, federal courts have required if you do that. But I think some of our big counties don't want to do that. They just want to do a simple release, which does not work, has been a failure. And so I think this bill says they can't do that anymore. So they have to choose between a bail schedule or individual magistration, which they can't afford to do. So there's still a fight to, ahead on on what to do uh, when the bill passes. I think that's absolutely absurd that it's even a question whether or not to look at previous yeah. whatever. That's it's insane. SUNY, yeah. I believe. Uh, do you have a question to, for for Ken? If I you do. Can? Since we're talking about not looking into criminal history or patterns, <clears throat> how does this factor in public safety? Like, how does all this figure into that? That, that's a really good question. And I think that um, the way I would address that, I would say, is what, what are you trying to do on criminal justice reform, bail reform? Uh, are we trying to set up a system that meets the constitutional requirements, like has procedures to protect the poor? Or are we looking at a system that's just fair? You know, where we get into trouble is when we look for fairness. Uh, when we talk about public safety, you know, we want to make sure we protect the public. I mean, like in mm -hmm. Harris County, when somebody's re as long as they're not released on as long as they're not arrested for certain crimes, they never see a magistrate. They're just released on a hundred dollar bond, no matter how many times they get arrested for that crime. So there's no gatekeeper. Nobody is doing an individual magistration. So when you look at these types of releases, you're looking at public safety and you want to make sure whatever you set up protects the poor, but you won't want to set up a system that allows career criminals to take advantage of the criminal justice system. I think what we're seeing is we're sacrificing public safety and some of the reforms across the country because we're trying to set up a system that in the end allows career criminals to take advantage of the criminal justice system. I'm not saying that these people don't have good intent, but they're not thinking through the reforms that they're proposing. And they're, the end result is they're allowing the criminals to take advantage of them. So I'm basic, So I'm from California. And in California, what you're seeing, especially when it comes to bail reform, is this notion that because poor people are um, disproportionately affected by bail levels, the actual fair thing to do rather than making it so that rich people also are more just as likely to end up in jail is make it so that uh, poor people are less likely to get in jail. So what is it? Um, what is the argument they make as to why this actually makes sense? Because you have places like San Francisco and L.A. that have basically decriminalized 
almost any crime under a thousand dollars in value. And they say it's because, you know, it's this notion that poor people cash bail screws over poor people. So what what do you think of that whole idea and, and the kind of laws that uh, come about because of it? Well, we have to start with, let's just ask the question, who's the victim? I mean, we would say, or I would say, that if you rob me, I'm the victim. And that's a we. Justice system, <laughs> yeah, that's a we. And, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> definitely a we. Give the redress to the victim. But, like, you've got the DA of uh, L.A. Uh, who says that we just have a different view of who the victim is. They believe that the real victim in crime, criminal in the criminal justice system, is the defendant. And when you do that, you're you're like in Harris County when you decriminalize uh, crime for a thousand dollars, anything under a thousand dollars, you're you're creating chaos. And like I've said, you're allowing you're setting up a system that allows criminals to just have run of the chicken coop. If we were in you know my hometown talking in farm matters. <laughs> no, that uh, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say, yeah, looking at what's become of L.A., especially like San Francisco, you're seeing these businesses just have to be closed constantly. I was just home uh, for about two and a half, three weeks uh, in early June, and it is just insane how quickly these cities have deteriorated. I remember 10 years ago going to San Francisco, and it was beautiful, and it's almost specifically because of these bail reforms that they're chasing that has allowed for this This just – there's there's no consequences anymore, so – I think that's the be- a good point is, you know, are we going to have accountability? And, you know, uh, in our inner cities, I would just highlight, you know, schools have failed, families have failed, uh, drug abuse is just rampant. And then we have no job opportunities in the inner cities. And we have all these protests from the last summer that have destroyed businesses. So they've destroyed the few business opportunities that they had. And those have not, you know, some of them have not come back, a large percentage of them. So we're creating... Uh, a, a never-ending cycle in our inner cities. And, and we're wanting to bl- blame that on uh, a, a disparity in race. And I think it's a disparity of of the inner cities. And it's that's really, uh, we're giving up on accountability. And so, criminal justice system used to be the place that was your last opportunity to become a pr- pr- productive citizen. Now we're giving up on that too. And now we're just, we're saying, you're the real victim. And really, maybe it's true. We have victimized you your entire life. So why sh- we should not yeah. let the criminal justice victimize you either. I don't think that's right. We need to be accountable. We need to we need to set a high standard for people. Maybe that comes into consideration on punishment, but it should not be guilt or innocence. I mean, if otherwise we don't have a society. Yeah. And I, I have an, a different uh, spin on a question here on what your perspective is. I, after hearing all of this, it makes me think, but do you believe there is a school to prison pipeline? A school to prison pipeline. Um, do you know, I do believe that there are cycles. You know, okay. uh, I remember when I was in high school, you would have so a teenage uh, a mother of a teenage uh, or a teenage mother, someone get pregnant. Uh, and then uh, you would, I would, I'm actually now the age where I can recall their teenage daughter getting pregnant. And so I do believe there are cycles. And um, I do believe that we, uh, if what we're currently doing is rewarding that cycle, and what we need to do is reward breaking the cycle, not continuing it. And so I think that I would argue that a lot of the bail reform that you're seeing nationally, especially in our urban areas, does create a cycle or a, a, a chain of poverty. And I think some of the reforms, especially you know when we're decriminalizing, so we're telling low level criminals, it's you're getting a green light. And so they start uh, committing more crime. They get more brazen and they start committing larger crime. And once they do that, well, now you've actually made their situation much worse because you've given them a pass until they they cross the, some line. And now they're looking at a much more severe penalty. And so we've actually created a worse situation for them by, by criminal justice reform. To, to me, it seems weird. It almost their stance, the the ones that stand against cash bail, their stance almost has to assume this notion that the majority of black people would be criminals, like the, or not the majority of, but like a very large portion. Um, therefore, it disproportionately affects them. If you if you're not a racist, if my part of my French here, if you're not a racist asshole, you don't think that, you know, 
98% of the black population, 99%, just as it's basically about 2% of the population in general that commits crimes that send them to jail. If you're not a racist asshole, you're like, wait a second, the other 98% should not be punished for the crimes of the 2%. But what the, it seems that these cash bail, what they're trying to do is a way, basically in end punishes the the law abiding simply for the fact that there's there's this this low this soft bigotry of low expectations that goes into these laws. I, I agree with that, and I think you know we're our criminal justice system is becoming a, you know this situation where we just have uh, no expectation for you to uh, become a better person. I mean, we hear that first time offenders are losing their jobs because they're stuck in jail. I don't know about y'all, but where, where I'm seeing uh, criminal justice reform, there's no first time offenders in jail. Like right now, the Harris County Jail is full. And the DA uh, there has testified before the Texas legislature. It's full of very dangerous people because of COVID. They haven't re been resolving any cases for over a year. And those people need to be in jail. Well, that creates another problem. Our jail is full. We've got low level offenders who are not appearing for court. So how do we hold them accountable without costing the county even more money? And so, you know, our judges, if you want to give them a good intent, are trying to walk a, a very fine line. But if you so I would argue you, if you put accountability in the system, it's going to get worse before it gets better because you're going to have to hold people accountable and show them there's consequences for them not doing what they're supposed to do. But if you don't do that, it's just going to keep with chaos. And so there, it's going to get worse before it'll get better. But you put accountability back in the system. It will improve. If you if you step back and look at things from a lens of you don't want to fall into the conspiracy angle, but this looks so much like the movie Demolition Man, where it's like, let's set up. So if anybody hasn't seen it, it's pretty old. Kevin, it's probably, you know, before you were born. But it's literally that doesn't mean I haven't seen Demolition Man. I have parents. My God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's you even worse. I have one. I have one. But still. <laughs> so ultimately what it's doing is we we've taken every element that we can to strategically divide our society. We're now giving a chance for light level or low level criminals to just be out on the streets that therefore become higher level criminals. We've now flooded the jail system. We've now taken a pandemic to scare the crap out of people. It's literally a playbook of destroying the foundation, not just of America, but the world. If you want to look at it from this really negative pessimistic lens I mean, just based on what you're saying, it could be really scary for somebody to look at. We're allowing criminals, especially, I mean, California, $1,000 or less. You could do whatever you want. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of crime that murderers commit that aren't caught for the murder, but they are caught for the under $1,000 criminal activity. That that's the reason why we keep some crime off the streets. This could become, this could be a tipping point where it could get really ugly. Or am I wrong about that, Ken? No, I think you're right. And let's, let's say, okay, well, let's don't be the total crazy conspiracy theorists, but I, I could argue a lot less uh, craziness that six months before the last three or four national elections, we've had a push for some scandal, which was intended to bring out one segment of the electoral to make them mad because so they would vote in higher numbers. And I would say that the result of, of some of our criminal justice reform, the push for decriminalization is a result of all of those pushes six months before election. And now we're at the point you're seeing it in, in our national Democrat leaders, that we're reaching a tipping point. And I would say Texas is probably showing the pendulum is starting to swing in the opposite direction because their bell reform is the opposite of what some states have done. And you're seeing that even, you know, the Democrats are saying, well, we're not the ones pushing defund the police. That's from the other side. So I think you're seeing, uh, and I've seen a couple of articles where they're saying that uh, they're expecting to be hurt pretty bad in the next year's election. So they're going to call uh, that it was all because the uh, the real voters didn't vote. So you're seeing the people step away from these type of issues a year before the election. So I, I'm speculating that the internal polling on this stuff has got to the point where they cannot continue this. We this will be the first national next election next year where you will not see uh, some big scandal to try to push and make a segment of the Democrat electorate mad because I think it it will turn off too many people. I think that's the point we are now. You know, I've got we've got just a couple more questions before we ask about the Capitol protesters. And I want to notice that when the cat came on the screen, we jumped about 15, we like 15 viewers. Super weird. Really, <laughs> we need more. We need more animals. Uh, all right. So the uh, the question I have before I get in, I want to go back to the state of Texas in a second. But with Kamala Harris, I mean, a lot of the Democrats, including Kamala, 
were big supporters, and I can't remember the name of it. One of our other hosts will remember of the Innocence Project. Maybe I think that's what it was no, called. No, nope. They are, it's they the, you're talking about the bail system they set the, up for the BLM. Yeah, that's not the Innocence Project. Okay, so what what yeah. was that, and how is that even? How is that is not that is that, how is that something that the GOP is not slamming doors and showing facts on how negative that was. What was that? Explain that, Kevin, real quick. Oh, yeah. So during the the whole BLM Antifa riots, and I'm sure, sure Ken, you would know way more about it. Um, I think you might have said Ken, but I heard Kev. So, uh, but um, the, BL, the whole BLM. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there was just these bails, these, these uh, funds set up to help fund the bail for these BLM protesters that had been had actually been arrested to help get them out. Kamala Harris was, you know, during the primaries this season, during the presidential campaign season, was advocating for these bail funds. Go donate, go support these BLM bail funds. Mind you, the people they're bailing out are people that were sealing cops into police stations in Portland and firebombing it or were doing other incredibly violent stuff. And they've tried, they have tried to pin her on it and uh, the the leftist, I think the problem is, is that the corporate media intentionally will turn a blind eye to it because it was pretty insane. But that's the gist of it was she wanted to get BLM and Antifa protesters bail. Well, and you see a lot of people being arrested. And so the call went out. We need con contributions because we need funds to bail out these protesters, these uh, these uh, people who were uh, patriots. And the problem is, you know, probably 99 percent of them that had their criminal charges dismissed and they were released without bail. So now we've got all these bail funds with millions of millions of dollars and they're a solution looking for a problem. And so, you know, in the Texas bill, they're, they're putting some restrictions on bail funds, but they're just transparency argument or re, uh, requirements. They have to disclose who they bonded out. They can't bond out uh, uh, dangerous people and people who are, uh, who are poor. SUNY, what is that right there? Is that the, uh, this See. is actually the yep, fund. That's, yeah, that's the fund. Yeah, yep. the, the Freedom Minnesota Fund. Freedom fund. There it is. Yep. And it, it, it expanded out to even more states to cover California, yep. Portland, everything else, like everything that was going on. Um, and I, I do want to ask you, though, Ken, so even if we get a bail system put in where it says, you know, even if it gets radical and it's like all people are required to be in jail until end of their trial, something obviously it's not going to happen. What's to stop these DAs? And these may these people these governors in these states from just pardoning literally everyone who's ever even accused to the point, or the the governors would be doing that, or the DA is just not even pursuing any form of charges as we've been seeing them do. You know, to a certain extent, we've always had uh, you know prosecutorial discretion, where you know I've just got so many staff, and I get to choose which cases we're going to pursue and which ones we're not. And you can even argue that the Bill Cosby. Uh, conviction being overturned was the result of prosecutorial discretion, where the, the prosecutor made a deal not to prosecute him and, and, and did it in such a way so that he was mandated, required to testify in a civil case, which he ended up paying millions of dollars. And that was the ultimately the reason why they threw out the conviction, because they yep. held the, exist, the new DA to that agreement. And so I think you've always had that to a history of, to a certain extent. But the problem we're getting now is... Um, you know, you go to Harris County, they don't prosecute low level drug offenses anymore. But you go to Montgomery County right next door, you're going to have a criminal history. And that, to me, undermines our criminal, the faith in the criminal justice system. I mean, we need to have a top down review at the legislature on what what are crimes or what, <laughs> what <laughs> that's of our dogs. Um, dogs get used. Um, so she gets the welcome committee. But <laughs> so we're going to have a top down review or we should have a top down review of what are certain crimes or but we need to be um, we need to be the same across the state. We can't have these systems where one county it's a crime and another it's not, and that's what we're seeing, and that's the, undermining our uh, our criminal justice system. I like that. That dog's got a good howl to it. Uh, <laughs> not a bad one. Oh, oh, my, my dog's the exact same way. I, usually, my dog will be up in my grill biting my Hello. ear. So, <laughs> Sudi, Sudi, uh, do you have a do you have a question for Ken? Yes. Did you say building? So, for the passing of this bill, which side is being more difficult? Like who's being cooperative and who's being difficult to, to actually get the one done? in Texas? Yeah. Good well, question. There's, there's two parts of our bill, the bill and then the constitutional amendment. I would say that the bill itself is uh, probably a more conservative bill. So, so it's written from, uh, you know, Texas 
whether it's been Democrat or Republican, has always been a conservative state. So, so the bill itself is more conservative. But the constitutional amendment requires a two-thirds vote. And so that means it has to have Democratic support to pass. And it passed the Senate, but um, uh, the Speaker Pro Tem, who's a Democrat, uh, you know, right before they left town uh, and went to D.C., promised that the constitutional amendment would fail. And so right now, the Democrats are the ones that are keeping the bill from passing uh, by leaving the state. And when they come back, if, if they prevent the constitutional amendment from passing, then that will uh, uh, then the state will not be able to uh, uh, deny people bail who are really the really the worst of the worst, uh, because our Texas Constitution would still require them to be released. What are the major differences between the constitutional amendment and the bill that would lead to so much pushback against one, but not necessarily the other? Well, the constitutional amendment is very limited. It just adds we're going to allow preventative mm -hmm. detention for these classes of people. And it's second time offenders, mostly for assault or sexual type crimes or who have a criminal history or a conviction for that. You can deny them bail. Currently in Texas, it's either capital murder or third time offenders. But uh, it, but it sets a really high standard, clear and convincing evidence before you can deny bail. So it's very difficult to deny bail even under this part of the bill. The rest of the bill, you know, there's many different parts, but the rest of the bill is the criminal justice uh, review of the criminal histories, training for the judges. Uh, and probably my favorite part of the bill is if you're a judge, you have to sign off on a piece of paper that you reviewed all these documents, and beauty, including criminal history, before you set the bail. And I promise you when someone is, is released on a bond and then they kill somebody, that, you're going to see that document on the evening news. They were released on you because it's a public document. They were released from jail by Judge Ken Good. And that's not going to be pretty. It's hmm. not Ken Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that we're talking about they're denied bail because of murder, yet, you know, we've got the January 6th protesters. And, uh, and Casey's got a question about that. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, January 6th is an interesting day. Um, I, that causes a whole bunch of questions for a lot of people, but. What is your like? What is the position that with the January sixth protesters? Like we we know some that are in there right now. It, in my opinion, it has not been a right to a fair and speedy trial, um, but they're being held still currently with a nonviolent crime, and they are still sitting in prison right now. Jail. Same thing. Okay, this yeah. is a very Jail good prison. example of the federal system for setting bail. Which yeah. Is and that uh, requires either you're released, released on a you know the equivalent of a PR bond or just a signature bond, or you're held. And so, like in the federal system, seventy percent of the people are just held. And the reason why we don't use that in other states is because we don't have the infrastructure to hold seventy percent of the people who are arrested. And uh, and so that that can't work. We can't use the federal system throughout the rest of the country. Uh, for those reasons alone. And so uh, it's not a good system for us to look for as an example. We have to find other th ways to process people through the jail and we can't just detain everybody. So and yeah, oh, go ahead, Casey. I, I just have a follow up to that. Do you do you envision that, that that might be a goal? Because you do see the Capitol Police set up, setting up offices in Florida and California. And so I'm wondering, is that something that that's trying to be spread to where that's possible? I don't think so. And let me tell you why, because, um, you know, the uh, Washington, D.C. is very one party uh, uh, centric. And as a result, you know, you had these people for the January 6th, whatever it was, arrested across the country and they were taking their local magistrates and a lot of them had bail set. And then that order was sent to D.C. And then you had a, a judge, I believe, in D.C. set aside that and ordered them to be taken into custody if they were if they were allowed to be released and brought to D.C. So I think you're seeing, I, I believe you're seeing the impact of one side of the uh, political process having a, a big influence. I think that's not true. We don't have another state, especially Florida, where uh, the state is 90 something percent one party. So I think it'd be very difficult for that to spread somewhere else. And, and I'm thankful for that as well. So 
My thing is, I believe that no one is ever 100% right about anything, and neither is anybody 100% wrong anything. When you look at the Republican and Democrat approach to this, is there anything that you look at on the Democratic side where you're like, you know, maybe their solution to this is a little extreme, but they're making a good point that I wish my conservative count, my, you know, my conservative friends would take a deeper look at maybe something it doesn't have to be their their solution but maybe they're making a good point about something that the conservatives aren't really thinking about is there anything that comes to mind for that uh no and i'll tell you and, and i'll tell you why and the reason why is because we can't have an honest debate uh look at the election integrity bill in texas that's, I mean, yeah, you know, Wall Street journal or you know several um, of the national uh uh, publications wrote uh, opinion pieces saying, "Bill is a reasonable bill," but the Democrats are really kind of stuck in a hole. They cannot say it's a, a reasonable bill that they want to push a little bit more to the left because the president of the United States has come out saying it's Armageddon if this bill passes. So they're stuck being uh, following the national agenda. The same thing happens on bail reform. Our, our friends on the other side are stuck on one side, and they're being directed by the national party. When that doesn't work in Texas because Texas is a conservative state. The reason why we haven't had a, a Democrat uh, uh, a governor in several years is because to raise money, they have to take the positions of, of the National Party, and that doesn't work in Texas. So they raise money, but they can't get elected because Texas is a conservative state, even when it was a Democrat state. Yeah. So do yeah. you think there's anything legally? I mean, if we're looking specifically, because again, our audience is always interested in cash and, and what's going on with the group of protesters. A lot of us know, and we repeat it, cash has a previous offense. He'd be in there either way, just not in DC. But the 30 people he's with have misdemeanors that for the most 25 of the 30 have misdemeanors of breaking and entering and trespassing. And they're being held since February or March, in some cases being told, they have to take certain plea deals, and some of them can't even take a plea deal to get out. How is that not a massive flaw in our system where you're having people on minor offenses that have, have zero criminal history being held for what it sounds like the first court dates are going to be in February of next year? So a full calendar year for people that their offenses don't even equal a year. When Okay, this is going to continue to be a problem as long as the party in power supports and allows this to take place because really what you would argue is this is just taking advantage of your political opponents so the party in power is taking and abusing the the followers of the other side and so i would argue these 30 people are there as pawns you know they're as pawns to the establishment on the right uh and and as long as we're gonna as the national party of, of you know the democrat party will allow that it's going to continue and I would say they're even they're better than allowing it. They're they're uh, uh, cheerleaders for it. Look at you know what we had today with their their little truth uh, uh, commission, which you know is anything but. If you listen to their speeches, say I mean it's uh, it's just going to continue on. And and I would even argue that the wor the more uh, crazy they get on that is it tells you how we're more worried they are about Trump. The more they say he's crazy, the more they say this is they're crazy the more worried they are about Trump. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, do you guys have any more questions about bail reform? We're going to keep Ken around if he's good with it for just a little bit more because him and I were talking a little bit about Simone Biles before and I would love him to stick yeah. around for the conversation. Do you guys have any other bail reform questions? No, I actually don't. I, I got only one. If you could snap your fingers and change one thing about our current bail system, what would it be? I think it's what we're doing in Texas. It's review criminal histories. I mean, Fair I, bail is, you know, the bail system has been around for over 200 years. We do one thing, one thing great. We get people to court. If our courts no longer care about whether people come to court, then you don't need us. But if you care about people coming to court, you need the private bail system. Plain and simple. We do one thing. We do a great job. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with you too. So. <laughs> I like it. All right, let's get really quick into Simone Biles. I think we'll do Simone Biles. We'll talk uh, January 6th commission after that, and then I got to play the Biden misinformation to wrap up the show. Tomorrow on Conservengers, I didn't talk about this, by the way. We do have, of course, a Conservengers tomorrow night. We got Matt Locke joining us from the Matt Locke Show. So episode 22 will be tomorrow, and we are going to talk 
A little bit about SUNY's show earlier today about the 25th Amendment quickly coming in hot, I believe, and uh, the fact that apparently Joe Biden wiped, got his butt wiped, which was super weird soundbite today. That was the weirdest thing I've ever heard, along with some of the other things he said in the last week about what are we drinking, the blood of children? Like, why would that be? Anyways, moving on, let's go to Simone Biles. This started a little bit of... Uh, of a brouhaha on my page, but a good conversation. So anybody that needs the up the back story to a bit, Simone Biles is the best gymnast probably in history, which would deem somebody to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Simone Biles, however, uh, no, Suni, I mean, no, you're not. You're not a gymnast. Uh, oh, you're a conservative GOAT. Now I get it. Okay. So with that said, she uh, she had a bad landing in the vault. And then withdrew from the team competition. And it was first stated that it was a medical condition. Then it was changed to a uh, mental health issue. And then her, <laughs> her, her comment afterwards was that she was under a ton of strain. There's also mental strain. Uh, there's also rumors saying that there's publications saying whatever she was doing was not being scored correctly. It was being scored on a curve because she's so much better than everybody else which again, I think is a little bit objective, but they have outlawed some of her best moves, which is a little bit rough. Regardless, she said it was a mental health decision that she pulled out. I'm still saying that she is one of the greatest of all time, physically probably the most gifted, one of the, definitely the most talented, but p being the GOAT, the greatest of all time means that you have the strongest mindset. You are a killer when it comes to the championship match. And I said, prove me wrong. And there was a whole lot of debate. So does anybody want to go first on if you think that Simone Biles is still the GOAT? Because And the reason I brought this up, by the way, is I saw it in an article. I, I'm not just going to randomly talk about it. I, you know, she's an American athlete. I like Simone Biles. I think she's great. But they said she proved herself to still be the GOAT because she pulled out. I'm like, no, that's not how I see things. But Scooney, what do you got? Sport the no. GOAT doesn't compete in. <laughs> yeah. Right. Scooney, um, go ahead. Let's just be honest, all right? You, when you're talking about the GOAT, you're talking about competitors that compete through rain, sleet, snow. It doesn't matter. Michael Jordan played through the flu. You didn't ever hear him say, oh, I need Food a mental poisoning. day. No. Uh, hangover. Hangover, Hang flu. No, it was, food, it was food poisoning. Remember? It was, it was food, food poisoning. poisoning. It was a hangover. He, no, he it is. Obviously, he thinks it's a pizza, the pizza, but it was the alcohol too. <laughs> She's. Uh, I'm just. I don't know. People aren't gonna like my my take on it, but this this is what happens when you uh, let a woman be a woman. Oh, I'm not getting scored right. Oh, this <laughs> is a hard. <laughs> oh, this is hard. Oh, I need a mental break. Like, bro, how are you gonna how are you gonna be called the goat? But you need a mental break. Then you should have never competed from jump because. Like okay, the 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 Olympics are weird. It just is. Everything the 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 temperature in our country is weird. Of course, the Olympics is going to be weird. They politicize it a bit, but I'm not giving her any slack, bro. I'm yeah, not I, giving her any slack. I, I, you, oh. You're the goat, and you have an emoji in everybody's freaking phone, and you needed a mental day. Yeah, that's I, BS. and that's like the Naomi Osaka thing. All these different things in there. Like to me, it's. It's performing at the highest level at the at the one Thank point, you. and you know what? If you have to break down, you wait until the championship or the Olympics are Thank over. You. It's, Kevin, it's from ahead. a broader. It is from a broader push to make to demasculate men. It comes from. It's it's. Let's put it this way, right? It used to be women that competed in athletics had to reach the level of men. So what would end up happening? You had women that would push through even more, especially during competitive events than men ever could because they were like, no, I have to prove myself. What we have created and instead is a culture that is overly embracive of mental, of mental problems uh, that calls for more men to be so open about their mental state that everyone gets every like, oh my God, everything needs to be taken care of. Like you're a man, you need to be so proud about your emotions. Look, that is what, that is what your, your family's for. That is why you have a wife because exactly. you need to be strong. We need strong foundation points. And this comes to now, when you look at it, women used to try to show so little emotion like like men do now you want men to show as much i guarantee you if a male athlete does this now they are going to be paraded around everything everything can just, like can i just make one comment just yeah. because I, i've seen something in the comments um 
When are like when are we gonna s stop with the like emotional antics to like draw sympathy? I've been sexually assaulted. All right, um, I'm right there with you. I put I put my business out on Facebook for everybody to know. People saw me have multiple yeah. breakdowns. It is what it is, bro. It, we experience it. We get past it. But yeah, making I've, that an excuse for why she couldn't compete, that's a crock of shit. I'm sorry. Before we, before we go to Casey, and, and here's my point, on, and I want to make a very specific point because that I, I am not taking anything away from her as a human being. I'm not taking anything away from her talent being probably the most talented, gifted person yeah. on the planet and, and how horrific sexual abuse is to anybody. Is. I cannot take that away. But we are talking specifically about one yes. terminology yeah. called the greatest of all time, which when you are when you're the greatest of all time at your sport, it's got nothing to do with your upbringing and past. It's got to do with how you perform on the field of battle. Personal Michael, Michael Jordan's father was murdered and Thank he won you. championships. He Thank won three you. straight championships. I have been sexually assaulted both in childhood <laughs> and adulthood. And Jesus freaking Christ, I am sick and tired of that being used as this. Some, no, like it is, it is the push for the victim culture. Everybody <laughs> should be a victim. So we should all validate everybody's victimhood at all times. It's like, no, this is getting ridiculous. Like, I don't mind talking about being sexually assaulted because I'm not sitting here crying about it in front of you guys and getting like right. letting the emotional side of it through because that is something private. That is something exactly. that is to be experienced with you and those that you love and trust. Not to say you can't right. do, be, do that publicly, but for Simone Biles to bail on her team, on team at, the, at the highest level, you can't be the GOAT if that's what you do. The GOAT fucking wins. The, that's yeah. all the GOAT does. The or GOAT they wins. Die, the greatest. Or they like, die on their shield. If she was, exactly. and I'm gonna, I, if it's okay, I'm going to have Ken go next because yeah, I know he was watching. No, you're good. He was watching last night. He, the, the, the thing is this. If, if she was being scored incorrectly, I know all the background. Everybody's like, you know, do your research. I know what was going on. They said that she was being scored differently, et cetera. The one thing that the greatest of all time and that the hero does is they go out on their shield. They find a way to go all the way until it, it there is nothing left. Now, there were things said in the comments that I was like, I can see some differences. But Ken, you were actually watching, I think you said you were watching when she, when she pulled out during the vault. What are your thoughts on this heated exchange as a group where we all seem to agree. <laughs> well, I feel, I feel like this is the uh, Michael Jordan fan club here because I, I kind of agree. <laughs> but, you know, I grew up in the Michael Jordan era. I don't remember Michael Jordan saying, I'm the greatest, I'm the GOAT, I'm the GOAT, I'm the GOAT. And so what, what I grew up with, other people talked about you being the greatest, not yourself. Now, maybe Muhammad Ali is the exception. But but I, that's, that's the mindset I grew up with. But I would also argue, argue that from the last couple of weeks in the, the tryouts, you could see the seeds of this. You could see the mistakes being made team-wide and by Simone. And maybe Simone's just trying to do too much. She's, you know, she's got her own gym. She's got all these new skills. She's trying to push herself. And you could even see commentators the night before saying, oh, Simone is so much better. She's going to give us a cushion to make for all this. So when we got there, she's like, she's got to be extra good so that we'll have that cushion for our just average people. And I can see why that would get to her. But I do think, you know, you can't be disappointed. You can't, you can't, you can't be anything but disappointed in her because when her team needed her the most, for whatever reason, she wasn't there for them. And it wasn't because of a physical injury. And I'm not trying to downgrade what she went through, but when her team needed her the most, she wasn't there. Yeah. Um, we're going to really quick say goodbye to Kevin. He's got a roll out as well. Yeah. And Ken, stick around for just a little bit longer if you can. Kevin, take it easy. Give a give a shout out to, to what you got going on and where you're going or whatever you got. Uh, yeah, what thank you so much. Check out uh, check us out. Well, we're out of time. He had to run. <laughs> Damn it, I didn't get it up in time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're over here. My check, eyes. Us <laughs> check us out over at Liberty Revolt Media. It's always a blast being here. And uh, I just want to say all of this, both of these issues, they come back to accountability. Accountability is one of the biggest things missing from our, our culture today. Uh, everything seems to be a way to escape accountability and as soon as we as a people decide i am comfortable being held accountable for my actions we will see a much better improvement but until we're account we're comfortable with that it's going to remain shit hey thank you guys so much for having me have a good rest of your night
See you later, Kevin. Take it easy, buddy. All right. So I want I want to sorry, who is that? I missed who that was, was me. I just said well said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. All right. So I want to go more because I, I started thinking, you know, what is the GOAT has to do with championships. And that was another issue with, you know, in the beginning of LeBron James' career, he he never hit a game winning shot. Like it took him years to get there, and people were already calling him the GOAT. And I was like, I can't can't be a part of that conversation. I used to like LeBron, LeBron James, but when you're talking about performing and people used a couple references, they said, Michael Jordan quit when his father died. He did not quit during the championship series. He quit after the season and went and played baseball. And you could say that's for his father or gambling. There's a whole bunch going on, but fact is he, there's no chance in hell he was going to leave during the middle of a championship series. And then two people say, well, mentally she wasn't there. So she could have risked major injury. That's what I, I'm not saying it's not a valid excuse to pull yourself out, but let's look at Carrie Strug, who landed during the 1996 Olympics, landed with one fucking leg. Like she had every reason to pull herself out, and she said, I was going to do it for my team. Now, that is something that a goat does, even though the talent wise, she has to me. If you want me, if you want me to say goat, the goat of the Olympics. Although Simone Biles has more medals than any other female American female gymnast, I believe I'm I'm like ninety nine point nine percent sure, and she's one of the greatest of all time. I get it, one of the greatest. The greatest moment, the goat moment, the greatest of all time moment goes to Carrie Strug sticking that in nineteen ninety six because she did something that was physically impossible because she was so strong in mind, had such a competitive spirit. She had the Kobe Bryant, Mamba mentality, Michael Jordan mentality, Muhammad Ali saying, I will not lose mentality. And I think that that's just lacking in the fact that we're, we're playing into the fact that she still deserves to be considered the best in the world is just, it sounds about right for America in 2021 to allow that kind of behavior to be considered the best of the best. Facts. I'm going to use a term a little bit different and yes, facts. I a hundred percent agree. Um, to take it the same direction, but it comes back to leadership. Mm. When you are the GOAT or you're the best on your team, you lead your team. And when you quit on your team, what does that say? That's why this is such a big conversation. Like mm -hmm. you would not see Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan. You wouldn't see some of the older guys that are like – um, Matumbo, you wouldn't have some of them just walk out on their team and be like, sorry, I'm, I'm, I can't do it. They don't. They are leaders. And leadership is important. And we are losing that in our country. And we are losing that in developing that in our kids. So when they actually come up and they actually get into these positions, they have true leadership. We don't have that anymore. Like, we still struggle with that in, in my current work. Like, it, it's not there. Yeah. And so you need to actually have a leadership um, mentality. And when you are the GOAT, you are the number one to where you lead the team and you set the example of we need to do better. Go back and watch the dance, the last dance by my, with Michael Jordan. He held his team accountable. Even his first year coming into the NBA, he was like, no, we don't. I don't do that. I, yeah. I don't do that. I don't party late at night in that. We don't do that. She, he, he did, did have like, – go ahead, finish up. Sorry. Well, he just didn't like it. Like, yeah, he might have had a couple stints, but it was not the M.O. You don't have the Golden State Warriors crapping on the Utah Jazz because they don't have a nightlife. No, you play basketball. Why are you worried about a nightlife? Yeah. And so that is where leadership comes in, and that is what was would be done. And Simone – had the opportunity and she did not do it. That is where I'm very disappointed. And well, there's some. Go ahead, problem, Ken. We can't, we can't have an educational, a, a, a hard educational or intelligent debate on issues anymore. I mean, we're now teaching our 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 young that you you argue and if somebody disagrees with you, you just say you're stupid or you're you're an idiot because you you don't agree with me. And so we're not teaching or even our kids anymore on how to defend their positions because even in our politicians, they can't defend their positions anymore. So they just say, you're an idiot or you're just, you're a crook, you're a right wing fanatic. And, uh, and so we're, we're losing a generational and just being able to debate issues. Like this is just a really good example. I mean, we ought to have some fundamental things that we all agree on as a country. Like we ought to be able to all agree she let her team down. At the very least, she let her team down. We should all agree with that. 
Um, now, are we critical because of, I mean, we can disagree about whether we're critical because we're not in her head what, what's going on. But there should be some, I mean, even if she, we think she's a goat, which I, you know, probably five years ago, I didn't know what was. I just thought it was an animal. But the, but we're now at the point where we can e even agree on some s certain things. Like we can't even agree uh, if, from a certain mindset that she let her team down. And we ought to be as a society, as a United States of America, we ought to be able to at least agree on something as silly as that uh, in the debate. But if you're defending her, you can't even agree with that. Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, it's what's interesting, Ken, is it, it, there's some people saying that because she was being scored difficulty, difficultly and saying that she didn't have it, uh, that she let her she actually helped her team by by withdrawing from the competition. And to me, I I get where that mindset can come from. But to me, that shows a mentally weakened society where we think that that's even an option. If you are the greatest, you go no matter what is going on. And to answer Kelly's question, did she call herself the GOAT? No, but what she said in the interview was, the pressure of being the best got to me and broke me down. The well, pressure of being considered interview. the best. She yeah. didn't say in that interview, but she she did call herself the GOAT. She had emblems, she had shoes, or she had things. Ah, that that's right. So she did refer to herself I as I forgot the about that. I forgot all about that. That's right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, she she talked about the fact the pressure of being held at a higher standard as the greatest in the world is what broke her. And is she physically and skillfully superior to all other gymnasts? Yes, 100%. And if you are physically and skillful, skill, skillfully superior to all other gymnasts and you don't win, not because you didn't try, but because you quit, then you are no longer the greatest of all time. And I can't think of another female gymnast that's better than her. But I just think it. Wa I think it waters down the greatness of of all the other great. I think it's just hard. I, I think I think it's. I th I can see the pressure. And Ken and I talked about it before the show that this year is different. They're going through a lot of different things. The American team is facing a lot of political pressure. There's also everybody separated. There's no fans. There is a lot to be said about why this is so much harder than other years. But when it comes down to being the best in the world at something. And being considered the best of all time, that shit doesn't matter. And as of this morning, we can list four girls from Russia who have the gold medal, who scored higher than someone who many people call the greatest of all time. There you go. Yep. That's perfect. Like LeBron James being carried off the court because of a sore ankle. Okay. okay. Man, LeBron James is a baby. <laughs> Nobody likes him. <laughs> Oh, Nobody likes LeBron. Like what? Captain accountability. Um, all right, Ken, it was so great to have you on. We're going to whip through the rest of the show. We're going to make it quick because we're already at our hour. But Ken, uh, is there is there anything that you're got going on that you promote right now? Is there anything that you want to talk about uh, or final words? All the above. The floor is yours. And by the way, I I, I think as as the reform bills are coming into action, please uh, have your have your team email me again. Let's have you come back up for a show, but go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, I just want to say that I am on the SUNY fan club. So I am signing <laughs> up for her uh, and I'm following her on all of her um, social media because I, uh, my goal in life is to be so SUNY. Uh, it's my mom's line. <laughs> greatest of all time in my book. I've had, a, it's been a great time. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope to, to be able to do something with you again in the future. Sounds great, Ken. Take it easy, brother. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you. Bye. Later, brother.